Hi, I'm James Eid of the Eid Foundation, but you can call me Jim. And uh, who am I and what is the Eid Foundation? Well, I started out as a chess player. I got caught up in this, uh, and my first tournament was in 1972. No points, no extra credit for guessing why. But yeah, I got involved in the Fisher boom. And uh, I ended up being a pretty good player when I was pretty young. You know, I got, I, I first, my first tournament was when I was age 15, but I started winning adult tournaments while I was still in high school. So I got to be pretty good and I became a FIDE master. And what is a FIDE master? It's a player that is good enough to fight with grandmasters, but not good enough to become one. So I turned my attention to chess organizing, chess governance, and chess writing. And the most popular book that I've written is uh, The Chess for Dummies, The Chess for Dummies book. And that's enough about me. But what about the E Foundation? What does the E Foundation do? Huh? Well, E Foundation is designed and dedicated to building communities through chess. And if you're part of a community, you're never alone. So and anytime you can get onto the internet, you can be part of a chess community. You can play someone anywhere. It doesn't matter what country they're from, doesn't matter what language they speak, you can play them anywhere, anytime, they're from anywhere, anytime. So that's great if you can access the internet, but if you can't, you can still start a chess community wherever you are, whatever country you're from, whatever language you speak, it just doesn't matter. And uh, the E-Foundation is designed to help you, um, to help you start up something. And, uh, you know, we, we've got uh, programs in Uganda, Zambia, you know, different places in Africa. We also start with senior centers. We help them get set up. And so why do we do it? We get little rewards from the things like this, say, you know, things that make just break your heart. So that's what we do um, for countries, people that in countries that cannot, do not have the resources to start a chess program themselves. If we have the resources, why wouldn't we share them? So that's the mission of the United States, uh, the United States, uh, the Eid Foundation. And um, we also do things like for chess literacy, we do that and for chess excellence as well. Alexi Root from the UT Dallas uh, won the Arthur Award this year uh, for her essay on what is dedicated to building uh, consistent with the Eid Foundation's mission. And she's going to write a book about the history of the U.S. Women's Championship. And it's a little piece of our chess culture that we just don't know enough about. And she's going to plug in and solve that problem for us. So that's part of what we do. And I think that, um, you know, that's enough about uh, me and about the Eat Foundation. And welcome to the show. It's the Chess Files. The answers are out there. So what's the question? The question today is, what is a state affiliate? the state affiliate of the United States Chess Federation. That's the national governing organs for the United States. And but states can be affiliates. And so I've asked Sean Jordan Manrose to come on and he looks a lot like his photo, but this is the real Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi, how are you, Mr. Reed? Good to be here and thank you for having me and Bear the Chess Husky. Okay, so a little more about Bear the Chess Husky before we get started. But the first, well, the first things I want to ask you is, is where'd you grow up? Where do you live now? And how'd you get started in chess? Born and raised in Lake Arrowhead, California, sitting in the same cabin. My father taught me the game when I was five years old and we got snowed in. Okay, <laughs> the, your father teaching the son chess is an old story. That's the way I learned. And, uh, you know, now it's mothers teaching daughters, too. So it's chess has come a long way in the United States. But Absolutely. you did it the, the old way. <laughs> the, <laughs> My so, father, uh, Dr. George Gary Manros, is a, he's a hero to me. And uh, without him, obviously, I wouldn't be here. But I wouldn't I really wouldn't be here as far as chess. And he's taught me everything I know. I love my dad and my, and my bear, the chess husky, with all my heart. They mean more to me than life itself. I wish I could have had you on Father's Day. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so bear the chess husky. Let's talk about bear. 
Mm -hmm. He's my seizure alert dog. Uh, as you probably know, I uh, spent about three years in a wheelchair having just a lot of seizures and uh, Bear can detect them between five and 30 minutes in advance. Uh, he got the brains and the looks of the family lucky guy. And it's rumored that uh, he's extremely powerful in chess, but Mad Magnus just keeps dodging him. So you yeah. may never find out. <laughs> he never plays me either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's great. So Sean, I know that you're the president of the Southern California Chess Federation, yes. and you're also part of the FIDE Commission for the Disabled. My most important um, work, yes, sir. And I think that is great work that you're doing. Um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but right now, the question of the day is, what, what does it mean to be a state affiliate? And you're president of the Southern California Chess Federation, yes. which is an affiliate. Oh, as a matter of fact, I believe we're one of the leading state affiliates in the nation. Yes, absolutely. Um, so state affiliates, in my opinion, of course, I'm biased, are the most important element of governance because that is the ground level. That's who the members truly talk to when they need empowerment. Most of them can't get out to Crossville or moreover yet to FIDE offices in Switzerland and France and Russia. So your state affiliate is your primary link to not only chess empowerment, but like you said, chess communities, which are so important. And by the way, if I may say so, you're far too modest. You're not just a leader of chess communities, you're a leader of chess in America and around the globe, but you know that. So at any rate, the the state affiliates um, produce publications. We have rank and file. We believe it to be the best in the nation. Um, one second, uh, a couple, right before COVID, um, behind uh, the amazing work up at Northwest Chess, they've never missed an issue for 50 years. Um, that was so- Shout out they, to Northwest Chess. Oh, absolutely. And great president josh sinanan um just a visionary of chess governance and uh, a dear friend of mine but the southern california chess federation is fortunate we have many peers um who are who are extraordinary i'd like to mention briefly the absolute my mentor um just a brilliant chess governance official a true leader of chess uh, the great dr salman azar of cal chess and tom langland the president of cal chess my counterpart um these fine gentlemen are some of the greatest leaders i have ever met anywhere in the world um and such as yourself from northern california i believe cal chess truly does lead the nation um sccf is honored to be their ally um our family in the north are so dear to us so important to us uh, that's really the future of chess in California, but that future includes things like tournaments. We hold great state championships for all levels. Uh, we we are working very hard to empower women. The Southern California Chess Federation is working with the FIDE Commission for the Disabled on uh, creating and then institutionalizing and actually getting to people the guidelines for the treatment of chess players with disabilities, which is an unabridged set of guidelines that covers every single possible disability. And so that these people, no matter what is going on from cerebral palsy and seizures and uh, to, to psychological disorders, even more esoteric things like some people will take a bite out of themselves at the chessboard, but they still have a right to play. Um, just they require certain steps to be able to play and maybe a little bit of isolation, stuff that doesn't, doesn't bother them. So we're not just trying to lead chess. The FIDE Commission for the Disabled and the Southern California Chess Federation working for them. We're trying to make it so that chess is the leading sport in the world for creating access for the disabled, which I truly feel we already are. But in creating the guidelines, we can create a model that is ubiquitous, that is archetypal, that every other sport can follow the lead of chess. And I believe that is the mandate we've received from our great president, uh, Arkady Dvorkovic of FIDE. And uh, it's our absolute goal to follow him. And it's my goal and my job and my honor to serve Grandmaster Thomas Luther, the chairman Shout of the FIDE Commission Luther. for the Disabled. Yeah, he's a great, and <laughs> wonderful man. I absolutely I, love Grandmaster Thomas. I'm the word isn't even so strong. Fond of him, yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely, yes. and and all the good work that he does. Yes. And and alongside him, Beatrice Marinello, uh, Nikos Kalasis. These people are not just heroes to chess, but uh, I'll also mention the late Carol Jarecki, just a beautiful woman who has done so much for chess governance for the disabled. Uh, there's a big team out there, um, but Southern California, truly honored to be a member of it to help bring that good work to the ground where chess players are actively able to engage with it. Um, and beyond tournaments, beyond publications, Southern California Chess Federation also uh, sends delegates to US Chess to the governance meetings where wow. we are the, what a former president of US Chess called us, the leader of the opposition. Um, I take great pride in that title, leader of the opposition. I've actually put it on my resume. Um, we fight for democracy in chess. And there was a group called the, the Governance Task Force whose specific job was to undo democracy in chess. I'll, I'll be sharing a quote later, but uh, the Southern California Chess Federation fights for what's right in chess. We fight for the members, we fight for empowerment through chess, and we also fight for the chess husky at the helm, fight for more tournaments, more representation, better publications, 
anything that makes the chess world better, including open access. Anyone who wants to get to me, as you know, can get me 24 7 365. My number is 909 734 0724. And any member of chess ever can get me. I'm always available because that's my job. And uh, let me see if I can show this. This is how you could contact the Southern California Chess Association. Mm -hmm. That's your URL scrolling across the bottom of the screen now. Thank you. Mr. I got that right. Okay. Yes, you did. My producer is on vacation. He's <laughs> up in Point Reyes. So, you know, this Lovely. is a one man show. And uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, he can he can still call in. Oh, OK. OK. Calm down. All right. So um, back to the show. Um, so this is how you contact the Chess Federation. And you would find that or someone on your in your organization would would get anyone who contacts you through that URL. Yes, well. we have we have a great team um, and uh, you can get to any of our governance officials. We're all very accessible, but uh, I'm the, I'm usually the point man. And uh, besides yeah. that, checkmate F5 at yahoo.com. Anyone who contacts me, I'm here to help direct them to their nearest tournament, their nearest organizer. Like like the Eid Foundation, we follow in your footsteps. The Southern California Chess Federation is all about building a community so that whoever can give you the access to chess you need, whoever specializes in whatever it is that you're looking for, we will get you there and we'll get you to the nearest one as well because we understand, hey, travel is something a lot of people can't do uh, not in a position to do others just don't want to so we'll we'll not just find your chess we'll find your chess near you and if there isn't any my goodness we'll make it we will organize it ourselves uh that's a huge deal to us as i know it is to cal chess uh it's just chess should be everywhere chess is the most important sport in the world in my opinion but again i'm biased <laughs> yeah. yeah but you're you described yourself as the leader of the opposition and yes. i just want to give a shout out to my late great friend tom doris who was uh, doing that role for northern california chess and um, there, there, he had uh, issues, and he became um, uh, quite unwelcome by <laughs> by many. And uh, yeah. and he used to tell me that when other people's blood pressure got got up, his went down. Absolutely. <laughs> Are you like that? Absolutely, it's become more necessary than ever. Um, so the governance task force. First, I'd like to start by making something very clear. State affiliates represent U.S. chess. State affiliates comprise the delegates who are the, and I quote from our articles of incorporation, the ultimate legislative authority of U.S. chess. I love U.S. chess. I serve U.S. chess. But U.S. chess is currently under attack from within and above. We have some really, really great executive board members. Some of them are amazing. Men like the great Chuck Unruh. This man is so good for chess. Shout out to Chuck Unruh. Oh my goodness, the man is, he's, he's literally a genius, but he's also a, just a gentleman and a scholar. I yes, absolutely right. love Mr. Unruh. Um, but we've got other members, a vice president who I will not name, but I will quote from his governance task force um, from 9.45 a.m. on February 11th of 2019. He said, uh, the purely democratic processes didn't work, so we discarded it. See, democratic processes aren't the be all and end all. Sometimes reality has to take precedence. Appointed members shouldn't be dismissed purely for democratic reasons. They have failed us in other areas, and the organization realized that and changed to what in many states is a non democratic process. This man is actually running for re election, one of three people running for three seats. Very transparent, right? Um, and he's going to be re elected. Uh, this vice president is part of the governance task force that is pretty much doesn't exist anymore, which was chaired by a man who had been a former president. Uh, they were trying to add four self-appointed seats to the executive board. We stopped them. They wanted to add a nominations committee that was four self-appointed by the executive board, four appointed by the delegates where they have massive political control. We influenced it. Now it's six delegates two executive board appointees. Uh, it, it's just, it's not about the members anymore. It's about an in crowd. It's about keeping my buddies around me, keeping control. And the mission has been completely lost, which in the first place should have never been put before the members. It is so important that we have the members first and then the mission, because without the members, the mission to, of empowerment through chess can never happen. And there's one other issue here. When we became a 501c3, we became highly partisan. As you know, as former president of the U.S. Chess Trust, the, ch the trust did so much for chess. The fundraising they did was absolutely spectacular. They Shout financed the U.S. Chess. chess. Trust. It's, and, and the great Al Lawrence as well, uh, who I know is a dear friend of yours. The yes. trust did so much that U.S. Chess going 501c3 was a completely political move. And even then... Not clear that the delegates voted on it. It was supposedly done in 2013, but no one can seem to find evidence of a delegate's vote. Amazing. So democracy has been under attack for at least 10 years. That attack's been accelerating. And Southern California Chess Federation and Bear the Chess Husky are proud to lead the opposition and fight for democracy, transparency, and integrity in chess. 
because we love U.S. chess. That's a that's wonderful and very well said, Sean. I Thank must you. say that um, uh, this has uh, been going on for quite a while, as you point out. Um, uh, what one of the things that I've said is that uh, you know they, they've um, there is a uh, difference between the the Federation's mission and the Federation itself. There's very many people that have lost that, that they're no longer focused on the mission and they're focused on perpetuating their own place in the USCF governance structure. And this is unfortunate, but it's part of human nature. And it's part of volunteer organizations. You know, they, in general, they, they think, you know, I'm volunteering my time and energy. I want it done my way. And, um, you know, it's natural, but, um, <laughs> But to point it out when it's actually happening, you meet a great deal of resistance. Absolutely. And, and it's very important that you say that you love the, the Federation. And, and um, this brings me to the topic of what is a Federation? It's a Federation of States, uh -huh. United States Chess Federation. But they have dropped the Federation. They want to be known now as US Chess. Uh -huh. So it, it's, it's de-emphasizing the Federation of States, which is Precisely. how it was developed, how it was formed, and how it was strong and lasting. Indeed. And so when when you lose the state's um, influence on the governance, even though it's cumbersome, it's geographically complex, it's difficult to get everybody together, they don't only do it once a year. Um, and you know, sometimes these things are slow to take place. Uh, change should take place in an organization like that. So some people got frustrated, and mm -hmm. it's I think it's perfectly natural that they wanted to streamline it. Yes. And the first thing that I saw was that they they made the uh, executive board the directors of the of the organization mm -hmm. and not the delegates. That so was an was... attempt, but that's not actually happened. So there's a very oh. important bit to that. So they keep propagating that story. The Articles of Incorporation what govern that, and the Articles of Incorporation clearly still state under item five that the delegates remain the ultimate legislative authority of U.S. chess, but that's why the 501c3 was done without delegate approval, because basically if the EB chooses to arbitrarily and unilaterally do something, it's very hard to stop them. The fact that the delegates don't rubber stamp it may or may not actually prevent it from happening, although what it means is it's not legitimate until they do. So there is an, uh, another element. U.S. chess would fancy themselves a standalone organization, in fact, the government of chess in the United States, but they're not. The same way that Southern California Chess Federation, Cal Chess, New York Chess Federation, Texas Chess Association are all state affiliates of U.S. Chess, U.S. Chess is but a national affiliate of FIDE, the true government of chess, who, although they will constantly bemoan, the FIDE has, yeah, the world government. And FIDE is is true to it to the to the, everything about chess they have integrity they're wonderful human beings they are truly global they are truly selfless they're not in it for the business they're not in it for the brand and that's something that u.s chess is right now which is extremely unfortunate but try as they might they can't get rid of the delegates they can't get rid of the state affiliates we will always represent them whether they like it or not and we will always lead them whether they like it or not although it is true on a day-to-day -day basis the executive board wields an unwieldy amount of authority. But there are some people, th There's pol the current power group is a very partisan one, which was against some of the greatest heroes in the history of US chess. Um, we talk about women in chess. We always talk about how we want more women. Yet the current executive board tried to force out Angelina Belikovskaya, the only person on that board, by the way, who was of grand of international and grandmaster level. She's a three-time US chess champion for women, 96, uh, 97, and 99, I believe. Uh, Angelina Belikovskaya is a wonderful, brilliant woman who, who teaches uh, uh, business at University of Arizona. We keep saying we want more women in chess, but yet why don't we keep the ones we have? The attack on her was vicious. She was forced off the board. Um, it was associated with, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say an attack because this woman is just too great to attack, but Beatriz Marinello, the first female president of US chess. The politics that was done against her was horrible, absolutely awful. And so when we take a look at, at how U.S. chess has a little bit been talking out of both sides of their mouth. That's why there's an opposition. Um, they would fancy that there is no opposition, that leader of the opposition was a quip by a former president, but there is. All democracies 
require an opposition. As U.S. chess tries to get rid of it, they'll start to ignore the fact, meaning get rid of democracy, they'll start to ignore the fact that there is an opposition, which only makes us more powerful, which only makes us more united. And in fact, on the governance task force, no one would have known what was going on had it not been for a hero who has served on the ethics committee and the bylaws committee and so many other committees, as well as the chairman of Southern California Chess Federation's ethics committee. And that man is Jim Manella. Jim Manella blew the whistle on what was going on. He's how I got that quote. He, he's how we knew what was going on with the attack on democracy. And they attempted to throw him off the committee. So when they did, we sent an email, Southern California Chess Federation, to every president of every state affiliate, many delegates, the entire executive board, and many members of staff pointing out what was going on. And we brought that to a halt. And Jim Manella was reinstated on the governance task force. So what's going on with US Chess is political, but it's also temporary. And we do have, it's not like we're in danger because we have amazing fiduciaries like Chuck Unruh. So the political issue is about keeping the members in charge in the long term and stopping this perception of, for example, oh, the delegates aren't in charge anymore. Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, the state affiliates are in charge. And US Chess hates that fact because it hurts their power, which is why we're presenting a unified dues structure at the upcoming delegates meeting. All that means, as you know well, is that anytime a member signs up for US Chess today, they have to go spend more money to become a part of their state affiliate to figure out who they are, and most frankly don't. That causes the state affiliates to have to spend time that they could otherwise spend on propagating tournaments, going out there and trying to find members, that they could otherwise spend on publications, going out and trying to convince people to read them if they should publish them. Much better if US Chess, who just raised membership dues by 10% for no reason. We have billionaire and multimillionaires who are underwriting US chess, but yet we raised the membership by 10%, which I as a delegate voted no on. We should then take every single time a person becomes a member, 10% of their membership dues, send it directly to the state affiliate that they register under and make them a member of the state affiliate as well. It builds communities. It builds chess players. It builds US chess. It builds empowerment through chess. And most of all, very importantly, it devolves uh, just a small amount of funding that would not hurt US chess in any way. Back to state affiliates that will not only create more chess on the ground, more tournaments locally, as we talked about, but also it will keep them alive and it will stop US chess from unilaterally dominating with a complete political agenda that hurts chess. And I think US chess has an interest to do that because they don't mean to hurt chess. Just when you get political, things that you don't intend start to happen. State affiliates don't get political. We're all about the chess. And so US chess has every incentive to support this unified due structure, but particularly the delegates do, who represent state affiliates and who want to get those monies, all of them back into the chess system because state affiliates are volunteer. None of us are paid. We spend every dime on our publications, on our tournaments and on empowering our chess members. And that is the mission of US chess. So if they fight it, they're actually going against their own 501c3 mission and vision, which as you know, is illegal. Well, I think, um... You know, what What you're saying, basically, I, I just was reminded when I was on the board from 1996 to 1999, I was pushing to get uh, Chess Online to partner with a, or, um, a group of people that were already doing it um, and form that partnership, that cooperation, um, so that people could, even if they couldn't travel to a tournament, for whatever reason, it was too remote or it was they could play online because the whole idea is to get people to play chess. The whole idea is not to get everyone to be a US chess member. It, the idea is to get them to play chess and be part of a chess community. That's the that's the mission. And so we forget the mission. And but um I was told then that um you know people would not trust their their credit cards over the internet. And so you know I, I could joke about it now, but back in the late 90s that would that was seemed like a reasonable argument you know the internet was newer and uh, people weren't so cus uh, accustomed to buying online now it's a, it's an everyday thing people buy online all the time they trust their credit cards to the internet all the time so it sounds like it was a joke that they wouldn't do it for that reason but you know in that time when you have to be compassionate about this in that time it seemed more reasonable because a lot of them were older white males that look a lot like I do now. And, um, you know, they, they just they weren't comfortable doing something so new, so yeah. novel. So, um, but you know, one of the things that I have noticed and it's from a distance now because I, I got so frustrated that I started my own foundation that I thought that um, uh, to do what I think is the mission, which is to build chess communities, get people to play chess. Be, and for kids, it, it's a 
if you give them the gift of chess, is you give them a gift that lasts a lifetime, yes. uh, because it teaches things like sitting still and thinking, like uh, postponing immediate gratification. These skill sets are directly transferable back into the classroom. Yes. And when I was trying to tell principals in the early 90s that they should have chess programs, you know, they would look at me like I was an alien with antenna. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, but um, you know, the parents caught on. And the parents put the pressure on the administrators. And then they were coming to me. They were, everybody, and so chess in the schools has exploded. Absolutely. And so what it was like in the late 80s, early 90s is nothing like it is today. So change will happen. As you Absolutely. say, the, every every point in time is just temporary. Change will, you know, you just can't stop it. Exactly. But there are there were these, these um, other forces that were, focused on, I think, on the wrong thing, uh, which was to make uh, the, instead of the mission, the organization itself more That's important. Right. And they thought it would be better controlled by those enlightened ones. And I have a couple of past presidents in mind that they were thinking that, um, okay, how do they maintain this control? Because they were the enlightened ones, knew what was best for the organization. And how did they do that? They um, had this governance task force, as you say, and then they they came up with this nominating committee, and um, and you know it was a disaster, you know it was a complete disaster. It was the idea of the uh, let the executive board appoint somebody who had a skill set, like like as if a, a lawyer that's that you know, and you need legal advice, but you know the lawyer is only a lawyer in his state. <laughs> you know, he, he might not know the laws in California, and so, and or an accountant. You would need an accountant, okay? But you know, you don't need an accountant that's a, good at, at this when it's you know maybe a tax a, attorney is more important. You, so you get what you need. It's it's the appropriate technology, and exactly. if every board is challenged with facing that facing that same challenge, and they have to find their own answers. And you can't perpetuate it because you know. You, you know, not to be too cynical, but uh, obviously they had people in mind that they were going to appoint to these boards. Oh, so, a former president. Um, I won't yeah. name the name, but we have a president, a very recent president who presided over the governance task force, who in fact was basically an accountant that they hired and then hand selected for the board. He spent 10 years there, ends up president of the entire organization. Um, you brought up legal fees. Let's look back at our, we have a consistent problem with driving women away from US chess while we say that we're trying to get more. Angelina Belikovskaya being a quintessential example. Beatrice Marinello. Beatrice Marinello. What about Susan Polgar? Everyone says, oh, Susan tried to hurt the organization. She cost us over half a million dollars. No, 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 no. They lawyered up and spent 600000 suing her. Five men. Five men are on that lawsuit, uh, one of whom is the person I quoted. Uh, of hating democracy. It's amazing. And so we have a bunch of men go after Susan Polgar, arguably the greatest woman ever to be a part of our federation. We spend $600,000 on attacking her. They end up having to settle out of court for 40,000 after throwing her off the board. And they say, oh, Susan Polgar hurt the organization. No, no, no. Our organization has a problem with going after women. We're trying to work on that. State affiliates are really doing everything we can to propagate good measures for women. But the political machine, that machine is just all about, like you said, keeping control, not U.S. Chess Federation, where U.S. Chess now so everything's loaded but one of the things i noticed was that he, that he put out a publication 80 years of the u.s chess mm -hmm. federation in which and, we talk uh, about the world uh tournament for the disabled and we never yeah. financed it despite being begged to the organization refused to yeah i very well know that because i spent up sponsoring <laughs> a lot of it through the trust and um <clears throat> the uh, uh leroy dubeck shout out to leroy he was also a big sponsor of dr dubeck um but through the trust, not through the USCF. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, but that publication never mentions Beatrice's name. Right. Completely and, for political reasons. And it's it, she was the first female president of the organization, right. and she doesn't find her name in there as the. Wouldn't that be inspirational to others? Uh, to, not only to inspirational. Shine a light on her. I was there when they tried to force her out. So you probably know that I was vice chairman of the U.S. Chess Accessibility and Special Circumstances Committee in 2018 when we were committee of the year. Our committee workshop literally packed the room with leaders of U.S. Chess. But that year, for political reasons, the chair in concert with uh, the same accountant who I was talking about who was president, had five key members, including Beatrice Marinello, myself, the co-person of the year, Chief Petty Officer Michael Lennox, who runs Chess Vets, which is all about 
disabled veterans, um, as well as Bruce Davis and Will Barella, all removed, and Will Barella, president of New Mexico, a great and brilliant man, all removed from the committee for political reasons. And then the very next year, I went to the committee meeting. There was four people, including myself and my father. That was it. <laughs> so it completely crashed. Without Beatriz Marinello, I could never have been on the FIDE Commission for the Disabled. She put me there to serve under Thomas Luther, and I am so loyal to that man. I love him. I love Beatriz. And yeah. I've been able to do great things, like, for example, carry on the unabridged guidelines for chess players with disabilities, which is a true committee project that US chess disdained because it was the medical model of disability. They didn't like that. They wanted something called a social model of disability, which in my opinion, actually hurts disabled people um, because it puts social agendas ahead of medical accessibility, absolute madness, but some people advocate for it. Well, the, gr the great news is organizations like the FIDE, Commission for the Disabled and the Southern California Committee for Disability and Accessibility chaired by the great Keith Martin um, with members of it, such as Dr. Steve Morford, who spent an entire career in Selpa districts. He was my mentor as president before me. Um, Abhishek Kalasa, our treasurer, my vice president, Dylan Wercha. We're completely anti-political. We are not going to allow politics to get in the way of accessibility for the disabled. And so U.S. chess hasn't exactly hurt these things. It's not it, but they've had opportunities to step up and help. Like they're about to have an opportunity to support a unified due structure. And they just tend to resist because they view it as a loss of political power. And anything that questions the political power of the regime is of course bad. So that's why it's so important that state affiliates and FIDE continue to run things. And US Chess represents America. And I think that's wonderful. They do a very good job of that. They really do. Like you said, US Chess, they, they've had their moments. They've done some important things. But like, for example, undermining the US Chess Trust is not one of them. <laughs> and so we've undermined our own committees, yeah. our own people and our, and our trust. So we have to get back and rebuild those bridges. And I think that's going to require a change over a political administration. But like you said, change is inevitable. As I like to tell my good friends at US Chess, tick tock, so mm -hmm. says Bear the Chess Husky. All right. Well, you know, also the committees were an essential part when I was on the board. Committees had a lot of uh, say. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure that's true today. Completely yeah. gone. Um, but yeah. on, a, on a completely other issue, something I wanted to touch on. Um, there's a mission that's international in scope that you are the worldwide leader of. You're truly a hero, Mr. Reed. Without you, in Uganda, people would die. The Divine Chess Academy is doing spectacular things. Uh, they call you a Papa Jim, I believe. And yes. there's a good reason. <laughs> well, there are children, uh, for those listening to the show, in Uganda, Uganda has been suffering from shutdowns from COVID-19. Without food, people are being told to shelter in place for not weeks, but months. There are children, such as at the Divine Chess Academy, which has over 50, who are literally starving. They are sick from malaria. Over and over again, they have no resources, no food, no way to get better. And if you've ever had a severe illness, you understand you can't get better without food. Mr. Eid, has been the number one contributor in my opinion. Um, with every time they have a need, Mr. Ede, you've come to the rescue. If we can't get more people to do that, this problem will self-perpetuate. But if we can get more people to follow in your footsteps as I have, as so many others have in the donation campaigns, but we need more, then what will happen is groups like Divine Chess Academy can purchase land that they will then farm and they can isolate while still feeding their children. And we're talking about children who are less than five years old who get extremely sick and do die without the help. And thank God it's been curtailed by heroes such as you, Mr. Reed. That is urgent. And another hero of chess in Uganda, Beatriz Marinello. I mean, there are groups who are working very hard, but without leaders such as you and without that movement expanding, it, it won't self-perpetuate. So we need to get to a position where Uganda is able to perpetuate their own assistance, where they're not going to need that outside help. And that can only come from helping them now. That is so well said. And the Divine Chess Academy is trying to create a community through chess. And uh, the guy that I work with there told me that when they start playing chess, they stop crying. That's right. And that just about broke my heart. And uh, so, you know, you, sometimes when you give, you get more in return. Yes. Than you could have possibly imagined. So and, true. Yeah. And so I, I thank you for bringing that topic up. And, uh, you know, as you say, I'm not the only person helping. And it, it is a, a combined effort and more people that... It, have the awareness and the willingness to help, you know, the easier it becomes for all. And I think that that's part of the community. You know, when you build a community, you start caring about people that you didn't know you knew until you started to be playing chess with them or getting <laughs> them to play chess or giving them just set, sets and boards so that they can play. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they don't have internet access. So, okay, start a community there. And they, and they have. So and, true. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so this is this is all great stuff. There, you know, there's and, a couple, um, well, with your permission, there's a couple ahead. more community builders I'd really like to bring up. Um, sure. In the U.S. chess community, we have a, a voice of U.S. chess, I believe. That voice is a man named David Nastasio, who you probably know. Um, yes. He's a nurse, works in a burn ward. David is a wonderful man, a wonderful chess player. He's a dear friend, and he's a, he's a hero of chess. And he, in my opinion, has built a vocal community in U.S. chess that talks about things like democracy and chess, that talks about helping groups such as Uganda. Um, and, you know, David's just, he's an international, he's a truly man of the world. Um, and another man of the world who I'd like to bring up, although from, from outside the States, is my dear friend, uh, Jamie Kenmure. Jamie Kenmure works hard in Oceania in Australia, trying to mm -hmm. build up chess communities that otherwise would never get together. And I think what ends up coming of those communities is schools like the one I work at, Rhapsody Education. Um, I had a my 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 longtime uh, president at Rhapsody Education, who uh, is now on my board of directors at Southern California Chess, Ashley Lee. Without her, I would have never gotten out of the wheelchair. She introduced me to a man named Master Zhou, who through Qi Gong was able to do amazing things for my neuropathy and my seizures. So chess communities go so far beyond chess. We leverage chess. So That's true. what like you said, what Divine Chess Academy does, that's what got me on this, is they ch children will stop crying when they play chess, but is that really what's going on? He's putting food in their mouths. He's putting a roof over their head, clothes on their back. My, Ashley got me out of my wheelchair. I've been with Rhapsody Education for over 10 years where I've met so many children who, who some are extreme, they come from very fortunate families. Others suffer from disabilities and require empowerment. Rhapsody Education has become a community for the Chinese population in Southern California where around chess, we've been able to build up an Ivy League prep program and help kids who otherwise would just be disabled with not a great outlook find anything they want in their future. And they receive that empowerment from the group and the community around them, which is built by heroes like Jamie Kenmere, like David Nastasio, and above all, like you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, you're so articulate about these sub subjects that I so deeply um, uh, believe in myself. And I try to uh, put my money where my mouth is. But, you know, there's only so much one man can do, uh, one woman can do, one person can do. It it takes a, a, a community, uh, it takes everybody, you know, pulling to, to, together and pulling all the oars in the same direction so that the boat moves. Yes. And I think that this is really what we're trying to build in this sense of community among chess players. And yeah, you know, the politics will get in the way um, and there will always be people that want power in any field you, you find it it's true they want once they get it they want to retain it you know these are these are the things that you know you just end up accepting because it's part of life but those you, you must persevere you must be willing to continue to do what you know is the right thing absolutely whatever and obstacles you face you can overcome and I think, by the way, um, with all the stuff we've talked about with U.S. chess, I, I'd like to have a, put a really important positive note in here. U.S. chess is now starting to move in the right direction, thanks in great deal to the opposition party, which led by Bear the Chess Husky, I believe we've called out all of what Gar Governance Task Force is doing, but there are new leaders in there now. Um, a wonderful man who at the recent International Youth Championship, my team won first place for under nine in the reserve. I was very proud of him. Student came first, leading the team named Darren Wang. But uh, uh, there was, we had one of our other students on Team Rhapsody, uh, his little brother hurt his eye and dr fun fong absolutely brilliant man career er doctor um just comes running to the rescue to help this kid uh dr fong now on the executive board of us chess is one of the visionaries who's going to lead us uh, kevin Pryor, president of florida is now on his way uh to the board he'll be elected this year guaranteed when you look at guys like chuck unra Dr. Fong, uh, Kevin Pryor, Th this is the right direction. U.S. chess is now starting to take a turn away from the attack on democracy that was perpetuated by a certain in crowd of ex-presidents on a governance task force. We've got the great John D. Rockefeller. I mean, he, I think he likes to be called James. Shout out. <laughs> yeah. Well, John D's magnificent. He works very closely with, uh, from my board of directors, the Dean of Scholastic Chess, who uh, Bear the Chess Husky made a motion in 2018 to make that title because the Dean has been protecting the legacy of the Deans of American Chess for so long. He's protected and fought for uh, Scholastic Chess for over 40 years. He deserved that title, Dean of Scholastic Chess, which was passed with uh, thanks to Mr. Lawrence and uh, the late acclamation. Ken Ballou by acclamation. Yes, you were there. You were a part of that, Mr. Reed. You, you, were, you were a key co-sponsor on that motion. We're speaking at Dwayne Barber. Dwayne Barber, Dean of Scholastic Chess. Yes, sir. And so when you take a look at 
Mr. Rockefeller, uh, Mr. Unra, Dr. Fong, Mr. Pryor, we're starting to see a turn back in the correct direction. What we're also going to need to do is get our women back involved. The leaders like Beatrice Marinello, the first female president of U.S. chess, without whom we wouldn't be where we are today, without Angelina Belikovskaya, a brilliant financial mind, a wonderfully powerful chess player, a sincere human being of integrity. Um, we should frankly have people like Jim Minella on the executive board. I don't think he wants to serve, but he's the most ethical man I've ever met in my life. Um, there's stuff like this where we have an easy pathway forward. We need to embrace the things that are going well, do things like a unified dues structure, stop resisting democracy and transparency and integrity in chess. And I think with the current leadership that we have, that is going to start to happen. And that's also a great thanks to things happening like California uniting. We have an alliance between SCCF and Cal Chess, the, the just wonderful people like you, our great Dr. Salman Azar, Tom Langland, President Langland from Cal Chess. These are the factors that are going to lead us into a future that is brighter than ever before for America's chess players. Well, Sean, thank you for being a guest. And I, I'm getting I, I'm getting told that it's time to wrap up. <laughs> and I'm sorry, uh, I, because we could talk for hours about these subjects. But, um, you know, I do think that you're uh, walking the talk because you're showing up at the end, you're speaking out, and I just uh, tip of the hat to you. Thank and, you. And so the, the question of the state affiliates role in chess has been pretty well answered. It's yeah. of paramount importance. Yes. So Bear the Chess Husky loves you, loves the Eid Foundation, and he's proud to pull this sled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am going to say goodbye to you now uh, and uh, say goodbye to the viewing audience. Hi, Mom. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> okay, that was uh, Sean Mon Monros about uh, what is a state affiliate to the United States Chess Federation? It was a federation of states. And what does that mean? It means that the governing body for chess in the United States is comprised of various state leaders. And they go to an annual meeting every year, because it's annual, and um, decide what's best for the organization, what's best for chess. That's the way it was intended. And it's been in existence for over 80 years now. And we have our ups and we have our downs. Sometimes the Times are tough and sometimes times are not so tough. And sometimes we do really good work and sometimes we don't. But you know, this is the way it is. That's part of life. We keep going forward, keep moving. We're like sharks. You know, if we stop, if we get stuck, we die. So keep moving forward. And that's the message from the chess files. The answers are out there. And this is James Ede. You can call me Jim. And I will see you on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much for joining today. And uh, thanks, Sean, for being a wonderful guest. Um, and I will, uh, you will see me next week.